here today. Um, we're all very excited to have you. My name is Melissa Wheeler. I'm president of the Concordia Student Union, and I'm here to welcome you and thank you. Uh, so obviously it's a pretty overwhelming honor to have Mr. Chomsky here with us today. A lot of planning has gone into today, so I'd like to sincerely thank all of our volunteers, members of the media, Concordia University, and my fellow executives at the CSU for putting together this amazing day. I would just ask that you please turn your cell phones on silent and uh, no flash photography, please. Um, now, it's my pleasure to introduce Caroline Bourbonia, who is our VP External and Mobilization this year, and she's going to introduce the topic of today, which is the neoliberal assault on the population. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. This is very exciting. I just shaked uh, Noam Chomsky's hand. <laughs> still a little jittery. by most measures, one of the most accomplished intellectuals of the 20th century. His impeccable and pioneering academic work in linguistics would, alone, have been enough to cement that status. But even more than his incredible academic work, Noam Chomsky presents to us all a nearly unique contemporary model of the truly radical intellectual. Despite the image of academics aloof in their white towers, Chomsky has lived and continues to live passionately engaged in the world. Over the course of the last 40 years, he has worked tirelessly to use his brilliance and his privileged positions to advocate for a global vision of social justice. His early and lifelong commit commitment to anarchism and libertarian socialist ideas under many rubrics, including anarcho-syndicalism, have led him to become one of the most important public figures in the contemporary left. His basic tenets of self-determination and the worth of each human have informed his critiques of both foreign and domestic politics. These critiques are overwhelmingly humane and empathetic in nature, rooted in a very simple and beautiful idea of a society in which people should be allowed to define themselves, to live freely, and that the practice of illegitimate authority is never justified. As students at, uh, at university or others involved in this privileged academic community, I believe it is important that we not just be here for ideas. Yes, there is probably nobody alive today who can give you a better grasp of how and why neoliberal ideologies undermine a universal practice of human dignity and autonomy. But there are also so few people today who will show you how to live your life in a way that answers that challenge. The world is unjust, but we are all of us empowered actors in society. We can step forward and advocate for these same notions of human worth, of the value of an unfettered human life, and use our privilege in the society to try and move towards it. Being an intellectual isn't just citations. It should also be measured by our engagement in the world and the effect that we have on it. With that, I am unbelievably pleased to be able to present to you Noam Chomsky.
population, which increasingly lives a kind of precarious existence, the deterioration of social services, the high unemployment, particularly among youth, old generations being sacrificed, and a shredding of political democracy. In one or another form, that's happening almost everywhere. Actually, the bankruptcy of the neoliberal model from the perspective of human life, at least, is uh, quite evident, even in the uh, richest and uh, most powerful country in the world, in fact, in world history, has incomparable advantages uh, right next door to you. Uh, there are more than 20 million people who, are, who remain unemployed after several years. Uh, there are millions more who are underemployed, Many more than that have simply dropped out of the workforce in desperation. And that gives the illusion that the unemployment rate is either steady or maybe even slightly declining, but that's almost entirely true to people just dropping out of the workforce. Uh, the healthcare system is an international scandal. Uh, Infrastructure has collapsed. Uh, you can take a high-speed train from Beijing to Kazakhstan, but not from Boston to New York or from Washington. <laughs> That's just a small sample. There are huge resources available. Corporate profits are going through the roof. Uh, the banks, the big banks, the ones that were responsible for the uh, latest crash, uh, they're uh, richer and uh, bigger than ever before after having been bailed out by the taxpayer. Uh, there's enormous wealth filling very few pockets. So if you put it together, uh, many idle hands, eager for work, plenty of work to be done, and plenty of more than ample resources available. But the whole neoliberal socioeconomic uh, model is so rotten that it just can't put them together. Uh, the impact in poorer countries is far worse. But it all does satisfy the demands of wealth and uh, concentrated privilege, and as function of democracy declines, as it has been happening, uh, then it can keep going, as long as passivity continues. Passivity or apathy or hopelessness among the general population, not a law of nature. Um, well, one significant effect of the neoliberal programs, uh, particularly in the English-speaking world, is quite a, ser a serious attack on the educational systems uh, that's been taking place as uh, business models are being imposed on the universities and schools. That is a pretty good, very good study of the impact in England in the current issue of the London Review of Books, an article by Stefan Collini. Uh, he points out that since Thatcher, uh, the public funding for uh, of, of students for higher education has practically halved in just 18 years. And gives a lot of other examples from which he concludes quite plausibly, I'll quote him, that alongside its many other achievements, the current coalition government in London took the decisive steps in helping to turn some first-rate universities into third-rate companies. <laughs> speaking world, in the United States, in Australia, uh, you know the story here, the schools, colleges. Well, there, there is a kind of received doctrine, standard doctrine, according to which we live in capitalist democracies. Those are supposed to be the best possible systems, despite some flaws. Now, there has been an interesting kind of theoretical debate over many years as to whether about the relationship between capitalism and democracy. Or, for example, are they even compatible? I, I won't be pursuing this because I'd, I think it'd be, I'd like to uh, keep to a different system, uh, what we might call really existing capitalist democracy, R-E-C-D, pronounced wrecked for short. <laughs> so to begin with, we might ask, how does wrecked compare with democracy? Well, of course, that depends what you mean by democracy. And again, there are several versions. There's a received doctrine, uh, soaring rhetoric of the Obama variety, patriotic 
speeches, uh, what's taught to children in schools, uh, government uh, of, by, and for the people. That's one version. And it's pretty easy to compare that with RECT. Uh, in the United States, one of the major topics of uh, academic political science is comparison of public opinion with policy, which is a fairly straightforward uh, enterprise. Policy, you can see, the public opinion is very heavily polled, so you have serious polls, you have a good picture of what it is, and the results are uh, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, stunning. It turns out that for about 70% of the population, it's the lower 70%, on the uh, income wealth scale, they have no influence on policy whatsoever. It doesn't make any difference what their opinions are. Uh, as you move up the scale, influence and, uh, slightly increases. And when you get to the very top, it's a, by now a fraction of 1%, you know, people essentially get what they want. So that's not democracy, that's plutocracy. Or maybe uh, Jim Hightower suggested you should call it radical kleptocracy. <laughs> and it shows up all the time. So in polls for years, the major issue for the public is jobs, quite naturally. And for the very wealthy in the financial institutions, the issue is deficits. Actually, they don't mind joblessness. Arms labor reduces costs and so on. And the polls are very clear. The policy is also very clear, the exact opposite. There's a laser-like focus on uh, deficit reduction, which has uh, good effects. It has the useful effect of reducing still further the weak benefit system. Uh, Obama speaks of a grand bargain in which Social Security and medical care, which are not very munificent to begin with, will be further attacked for the reduced, and it also uh, undermines labor by creating what's called the greater worker insecurity, which is very good for the health of the economy by economic measures. The term greater worker insecurity is uh, from a former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan, his testimony to Congress is providing his recommendation for a healthy economy. Now, those are in the days when he was still St. Allen, the greatest economist since Adam Smith. That's kind of forgotten since his uh, religious doctrines uh, led to the great crash of 2008. And there's the same disparity between public opinion and policy on quite a wide range of issues, domestic and international. So domestically, it takes, say, the minimum wage, which has declined real minimum wage declined very sharply since the 60s. Uh, about, uh, there's one view that it should be indexed uh, to the cost of living and high enough to prevent falling below the poverty line. Uh, that's about 80% of the public, much smaller percentage of the wealthy, and it declines. Uh, same with the laws that facilitate union activity. The same on national health care. So uh, when the latest so-called Obamacare was passed, uh, almost two-thirds of the public favored uh, the public option, just extending public care in the U.S. that would be Medicare to the entire population, which would be very efficient, uh, cost-effective, uh, no snafus with computers. Uh, but uh, uh, Obama didn't even try. Uh, for 35 years, large majorities have held that uh, taxes should be raised sharply on the wealthy and on corporations. Taxes steadily go down, and on and on. Uh, consistently, also internationally, uh, policy is the opposite of public opinion. And that's a typical property of RECT. Uh, in the past, say 40, 50 years ago, the United States was described sardonically, but not inaccurately, as a one-party state, the business party, with two factions, Democrats and Republicans. That's no longer quite true. Uh, it's still a one-party state, the business party, but now there's only one faction, moderate Republicans. They're called 
Democrats. About it are the moderate Republicans of a generation ago. Actually, Richard Nixon today would be so far on the left, you can barely see him. There is still something called the Republican Party, but it long ago abandoned any pretense of being a normal parliamentary party. It's just in lockstep service to the rich in the corporate sector as a catechism that everyone has to follow. Uh, and it's understood that one of the most uh, distinguished uh, conservative political commentators in the country, Norman Ornstein of the Right Wing American Enterprise Institute, and he describes today's Republican Party as, in his words, a radical insurgency, ideologically extreme, scornful of facts and compromise, dismissive of its political opposition, a serious danger to the society, and we can add, because of American power, a uh, serious danger to the world. Well, in brief, uh, RECT is very remote from the soaring rhetoric about democracy. But it's worth bearing in mind that there's another version of democracy. In fact, it's the standard doctrine of uh, uh, progressive contemporary democratic theory. Just give you some illustrative quotes from leading figures. And so like, this is not from the right. These are all a good uh, Woodrow Wilson, FDR, uh, Kennedy, liberals. representative quotes. Now, the public are ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. Now, they have to be put in their place. Decisions must be in the hands of an intelligent minority of responsible men, and they have to be protected from the trampling and roar of the bewildered herd of the general population. Now, the herd has what's called a function. They're supposed to lend their weight every few years to a choice among the responsible men and to go home. Apart from that, their function is to be spectators, not participants in action. And all of this is for their own good. Uh, we should not succumb to democratic dogmatism about men being the most best judges of their own interests. They're not, uh, we're the best judges. So therefore, attitudes and opinions must be controlled, we must regiment the minds of men the way an army regiments its body. It's also necessary to discipline the institutions responsible for what's called the indoctrination of the young. Uh, we have to get back to the good old days uh, when Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. These are quotes from icons of the liberal establishment leading progressive democratic theorists. On the right, of course, it's far more extreme. Well, there have been popular struggles over the years. They've won many significant victories. In many ways, the country's a lot more civilized than it was a couple generations ago. But the masters uh, never relent. The more freedom is won, the more intense are the efforts to redirect the society to a proper course. The, 20th century progressive democratic theory that I've just been quoting is not very different from the rect that has been established, apart from the question of which responsible men should rule. And should it be bankers or intellectual elites, or for that matter, should it be a, a central committee in a different version of similar doctrines, it's misdescribed as the left. Another important feature of RECT is that uh, the public must be kept in the dark about what is happening to them. The herd must remain bewildered. The reasons were explained lucidly by uh, the professor of the science of government at Harvard University, Samuel Huntington, or Icon. And what he pointed out is that power remains strong when it remains in the dark exposed to the sunlight, it begins to evaporate. Uh, Bradley Chelsea Manning is facing a life in prison for failure to comprehend this scientific principle. And a pretty 
assume Edward Snowden will probably face the same. And it works pretty well. Uh, recent polls show almost total confusion on the part of the public. So for example, the Republicans are actually preferred to Democrats on most issues when people are asked to be preferred. But when you go to the specific issues, it's the opposite. Uh, Republican policies are strongly opposed. Uh, one very striking example, which I already mentioned, is uh, attitudes on tax policy. Uh, the public, when asked, says they favor the Republicans on tax policy by a large majority. And that same majority opposes their policies. Uh, this goes along with an astonishing level of contempt for government. There's never been anything like it. Uh, approval ratings for Congress hover around uh, single digits. The contemporary current Republican Party has the lowest approval ranking of anything in American history. But, but when asked who do you prefer? The public still says the Republicans. Uh, re results like these, which are pretty consistent, they illustrate a kind of demoralization of the public of a kind that's unusual. Uh, in fact, there are examples and not very attractive ones. But one of the main examples that comes to mind is the late Weimar Republic. Well, the core of the economy today, last generation is uh, financial institutions. There's been a vast expansion since the 1970s. Uh, alongside of that has been an accelerated shift of production to places where labor can be more efficiently exploited. Uh, the, by 2007, right on the eve of the latest crash, 40% of corporate profit was in financial institutions, the institutions that were largely responsible for the crash. Uh, after the crisis, a small number of economists, some quite prestigious ones, uh, pointed out that the, uh, that the economics profession hadn't really done much study of the impact of uh, financial institutions uh, on the economy. And the few who looked at it uh, said, well, they think it's probably negative. But there are some who are much more outspoken, and probably the most uh, uh, respected uh, financial uh, journal correspondent in the English-speaking world is uh, Martin Wolf of the London Financial Times. Uh, he writes that an out-of-control financial sector is eating out the modern market economy from inside, just as the larva of a spider wasp eats out the host in which it has been laid. Uh, there was a recent report in the main Business Week, Bloomberg Business Week, it was reporting a study by the IMF which found that the largest banks literally make no profit. What they earn traces almost entirely to a government insurance policy. It's what's called the too big to fail. And there is a widely publicized bailout, but that's actually the least of it for many other devices. And the editors of the journal point out that this is crucial to understanding why the big banks present such a threat to the global economy and to the people of the country. Uh, that's uh, from the mainstream business press. Well, what about the productive economy? Actually, there's a mantra about this too. The mantra is that the productive economy is based on entrepreneurial initiative and consumer choice in a free market, and there's talk about free market, uh, free trade agreements, and things like that. Now, the reality is quite different. The free trade agreements have very little to do with free trade, in fact, little to do with trade altogether. In the economy, the productive economy, there's always been massive state intervention. One striking example now is the uh, IT revolution information technology revolution, computers, the internet, and so on. Now that's driving much of the contemporary economy. And if you look at its history, you'll see that the hard and costly and creative work was substantially in the state sector for several decades, no consumer choice. There was some entrepreneurial initiative, but it was 
primarily limited to getting government grants and bailouts and also relying on procurement. That's an often ignored, but government procurement is a very significant factor in corporate profit. Well, after a long period of creative work of research and development, uh, the result in the state sector, pretty much in the state sector, the results are handed over to private enterprise for commercialization and profit. It's not quite that simple, but that's a pretty close approximation to the actual picture. And the system goes way back, but it's dramatically true since World War II. Uh, another central and crucial aspect of REC is concentration of capital. Uh, just in the past 20 years, the share of profits of the 200 largest enterprises in the U.S. has risen sharply. It's probably the effect of the internet. And these developments towards oligopoly uh, also undermine the free market uh, mantra. These are quite interesting topics. I won't pursue them here. Let me turn to a different question. Uh, what are the prospects for the future under RECT? Uh, the an answer is pretty grim. It's no secret that among the many dark shadows uh, hovering over every topic that we discuss, there are two that are particularly ominous. The one is environmental catastrophe, the other is nuclear war, both of which threaten the prospects for decent survival. Well, I'm not going to say much about the first, environmental catastrophe. This, I think you should all be aware of that without comment. The scale of the danger is obvious to anyone who has their eyes open. Uh, those of you who read major scientific journals will be aware that just about every issue has more dire warnings than the last one. And they're very serious and imminent, a generation or two maybe. And there are various reactions to this. At one extreme, there are some who try to act decisively to prevent a possible catastrophe. At the other extreme, uh, major efforts are underway to accelerate the catastrophe. And it's interesting to see who's involved in these. Uh, leading the effort to intensify the likely disaster are the richest and most powerful countries in the world uh, with incomparable advantages. And the most prominent examples of wreck particularly the United States. Uh, Canada increasingly resembles its southern neighbor, and it's one of the leading culprits. It's not just covered at tar sands and so on, but uh, Canadian mining, uh, which is a plague around the world. That's trying to accelerate the crisis. Uh, leading the effort to preserve conditions in which our immediate descendants and might have a decent life are the so-called primitive societies. In Canada, it's First Nations. That's where it's tribal, Aboriginal. Uh, in fact, uh, the countries that have large and influential indigenous populations are well in the lead in seeking to defend the earth and the prospects for decent survival. Uh, the, uh, the countries that have large indigenous populations uh, are, uh, take, say, Ecuador, quite a large indigenous population. Uh, they have, uh, the, the indigenous population want, they have substantial oil resources. The indigenous population wants to keep in the ground you know, where they ought to be. Uh, Ecuador has sought aid from the rich countries to help them, to help them subsidize them to keep, to prevent, to not to produce oil. They couldn't get the aid, so now they're going to produce the oil. Uh, that's, uh, the rich just wouldn't pay. Now that's indigenous societies. I Meanwhile, I'll turn to say the U.S. and Canada. Now they are enthusiastically, both of them, seeking to burn fossil fuels, including the most dangerous kinds, and to do so as quickly and fully as possible uh, without a side glance at uh, what the world might look like after this extravagant commitment to self-destruction. Actually, every 
issue of the daily newspapers uh, illustrates this lunacy, and lunacy is the right word, word for it. It's all exactly the opposite of what rationality would demand, unless it's the skewed form of rationality of correct. There have been massive corporate campaigns to safeguard the lunacy. Uh, despite them, it turns out that there's still a real problem in American society. The public is still too committed to scientific rationality, as polls reveal. Uh, one of the many divergences between policy and opinion is that the American public is pretty close to the international norm in uh, concern about the environment and in calling for decisive actions to do something about it. And meanwhile, bipartisan policy is dedicated to trying to maximize the catastrophe. It's called the 100 years of energy independence, a totally meaningless notion. Uh, well, the corporate world is not overlooking this. They're kind of riding to the rescue. <coughs> there is a corporate-funded organization, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. And what it does is design legislation uh, for states. Uh, you can guess what kind of legislation. It's now instituting a program to overcome the excessive rationality of the public. Programs from K-12, kindergarten through high school. And the program is designed, as they put it, to improve critical faculties by balanced teaching. And what that means is that if a sixth grade class uh, learns something about the climate, uh, they also must be exposed to climate change denial. <laughs> and maybe that'll help overcome the failure so far of massive corporate propaganda uh, to make the population ignorant and irrational enough to safeguard short-term profit for the rich at the expense of the lives of the grandchildren. And it's important to remember that all of these are deep-seated institutional properties of RECT, not easy to uproot. And for such reasons, the prospects for decent survival under really existing capitalist democracy are pretty dim. Well, let's turn to the other dark shadow, nuclear war, which isn't discussed as much as it should be. It's a real threat. It's been a threat for over 70 years. It still is, in some ways, growing. But one reason for that is that under RECT, the rights and needs of the general population are a pretty minor matter, and that extends to security. There is a prevailing doctrine in the academic professions, too, which is that governments seek to protect national security. Actually, that's mostly myth when you look closely. Governments seek to protect power and domination and to benefit their primary constituents, which in societies like ours are the corporate sector. And the, the consequence is the security does not have a high priority. Actually, we see that all the time, and right now, in fact. So take, say, uh, Obama's uh, drone campaign, or take, just take his operation, one example, his operation to murder Osama bin Laden a couple months ago. Uh, bin Laden was a prime suspect for the 9-11 attack. Actually, Obama made a very important speech last May on national security, very widely covered. But one crucial paragraph was ignored. In this paragraph, Obama held the operation, but he added that it cannot be the norm, quoting. The reason he said is that the risks were immense. Uh, the Navy SEALs who broke into Pakistan and murdered the suspect, uh, they might, he said, have been embroiled in an extended firefight. But even though, by luck, that didn't happen, the cost to our relationship with Pakistan and the backlash among the Pakistani public over encroachment on their territory was extremely severe. Well, let's add a couple of details to that. The SEALs were under orders to fight their way out if they were apprehended, and they would certainly not have been left uh, to be massacred by the 
the Pakistani army, uh, the U.S. would have used the force of its military to extricate them. Pakistan has a powerful army, well-trained, uh, highly protective of state sovereignty. Of course, it has nuclear weapons, and uh, leading Pakistani and foreign specialists are quite concerned by the exposure of the nuclear weapon system to jihadi elements. It could have escalated to nuclear war. In fact, it came very close. And while the SEALs were still in the bin Laden compound, the Pakistani chief of staff, General Kayani, was informed of the invasion, which he assumed was probably from India. Uh, and uh, he ordered his staff, his words were, to confront any unidentified aircraft. Uh, meanwhile, in Kabul, General David Petraeus ordered U.S. warplanes to respond, his order, if Pakistanis scrambled their fighter jets. That's how close it was. Well, as Obama said, by luck it didn't happen. But the risk was faced, risk of nuclear war, and strikingly without any particular concern. Well, let's in fact go to the drone campaign. And you should know, everyone should know, that Obama is now conducting by far the world's greatest terrorist campaign. That's what it is. It's a drone campaign targeting suspects, terrorizes communities, regions, whole regions. It's also a terror-generating campaign, and that's a common understanding at the highest level. It's understood that when you kill somebody in a community, you create many new enemies. Uh, just take, say, the marathon bombing in Boston a couple months back. Uh, everyone remembers that. And what is less known is that two days after the marathon bombing, there was a drone attack in Yemen. Now, usually we don't hear about the drone attacks, but this one happened to be publicized because by accident there was a young Yemeni man in the United States from the village that was attacked. And as it happened, he testified uh, to the Senate, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, he reported that his village in Yemen had been subjected to several years of intensive jihadi propaganda trying to try to turn the villagers against the United States. But they didn't know anything about the United States except what he was reporting to them, which was pretty favorable. And then he added that this single drone attack to, to murder a suspect who was well known and could easily have been apprehended, that single drone attack turned the villagers into people who hate America and want to take revenge. And that's the way you can create terrorists. Well, right now, the government is defending the massive surveillance operation that's been re revealed, uh, and the grounds are that it might apprehend terrorists. Uh, so let's imagine that there were a free press in the United States and Canada. <laughs> the headlines would be ridiculing this claim on the very simple grounds that the policy is designed in such a way that it amplifies the terrorist press. In fact, even instant destruction by nuclear weapons has never been a high concern for state authorities. And the record on this is pretty striking. You should think about it. So let's go back to, say, 1950. At that point, the US was overwhelmingly powerful militarily, uh, enormous security. There was one potential threat, uh, ICBMs with uh, hydrogen bomb warheads. Uh, there's a standard history of the nuclear weapon system by George Bundy, who's National Security Advisor for Kennedy and Johnson. He had access to the highest level documents. But one of the things he points out, just kind of in passing, two or three sentences, is that of course the US military understood, US intelligence understood the nature of this potential threat, but he could not find even a staff paper, any mention in the record that anyone ever considered, ever, anyone ever considered, for example, uh, trying to negotiate a treaty with the Russians to ban production of these weapons, which they might very well have accepted. And they were so far behind technologically, they might well have accepted it. But nobody, nobody even considered it. There was no consideration 
Russian officer. Uh, there were, they have automated response systems which work much more poorly than ours, and ours don't work very well. And there was a signal from them that they should launch a nuclear strike. There was a signal saying the U.S. is attacking. And there is human intervention. This particular guy, Petrov, was supposed to send the signal. He decided to disobey orders. Again, that's why we're sitting here. These things continue constantly. Uh, most recent example is the bin Laden assassination, the most recent one we know about. Well, there are new threats waiting, and it's actually worth looking at official doctrine, public official doctrine, which is rarely discussed. For example, there was an important study by uh, Clinton's uh, strategic, STRATCOM, Strategic Command, in charge of nuclear weapons. It's called Essentials of Cold War Deterrence. And I'll quote from it. Uh, it's about the role of nuclear weapons in the post-Cold War era. And its central conclusion is, the United States must maintain the right of first strike, even against non-nuclear states. Furthermore, nuclear weapons must always be available at the ready because they cast a shadow over any crisis or conflict. What that means is that they're constantly used just as if you go into a store with a gun and threaten the store owner and you don't shoot the gun, you're using the gun. Same with nuclear weapons. Uh, Stratcom goes on to explain, I'm quoting, planners should not be too rational about determining what the opponent values the most. Everything must be targeted. It hurts to portray ourselves as too fully rational and cool-headed that the U.S may become irrational and vindictive should be part of its of the national persona we project. It's beneficial for our strategic <coughs> posture if some elements may appear to be potentially out of control, sometimes called the madman doctrine. Well, again, Western intellectuals and the media can choose to avert their eyes, but uh, potential targets really don't have the luxuries of the privileged and the powerful. Well, a final comment on this. Uh, there's a lot of concern right now about a potential confrontation with China. And it's very intriguing to see how the confrontation is formulated in the West. So a couple of months ago, the New York Times had a report about uh, China's threatening military buildup, a uh, warning about it. Of course, it's a tiny fraction of the US military system. And it's depicted as, I'm quoting, a serious challenge to the United States in the waters around China. Okay? <laughs> Not in the Caribbean, <laughs> in the waters around California, where it wouldn't be tolerated for one moment. Uh, strategic analysts describe the US-China confrontation as what they call a classic security dilemma, in which each side sees fundamental interest at stake, which it can't abandon. The fundamental interests yeah, are uh, control over uh, China's waters, waters off China's coast. Uh, well, that's uh, the US policy of controlling those waters is considered a defensive position in the West. China sees it a little differently. <laughs> this classic security dilemma makes perfect sense on the assumption that the U.S. has the right to control the world and that what U.S. security requires is something like absolute global control. Well, a final comment to put this in historical perspective. Uh, next year, we'll begin to commemorate the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, Foundations of Modern Law. We won't be celebrating the occasion will be more likely uh, interring what's left of its bones after Bush and Obama and their colleagues elsewhere have finished uh, ripping off the flesh. Mm -hmm. Magna Carta had two components. The one of them is pretty well known. It's called the Charter of Liberties. The other, less known, is the Charter of the Forests. Uh, the first, the Charter of Liberties, uh, formulated fundamental principles of law, such as uh, what's called presumption of innocence. State cannot punish until guilt has been established by a speedy trial, 
before a jury of peers in an honest court. These rights were extended over the centuries. The past decade they've been eviscerated, now being shredded with very little comment. But more interesting is the second charter, the Charter of the Forests. That called for protection of the commons from the depredations of authority. The commons were the traditional source of sustenance and welfare. It was carefully nurtured by the public in common over centuries. It's been steadily dismantled under the capitalist principle that uh, everything has to be privately owned. Canada's in the lead in trying to enforce this throughout the world. Uh, there is uh, also a perverse doctrine associated with it that I'm sure you've heard. It's called the tragedy of the commons. What it holds is if the things are held in common, uh, they'll be despoiled, so therefore they have to be privatized. Just the merest glance at the modern world shows it's quite the opposite. It's privatization that's destroying the commons. The indigenous populations of the world, as I mentioned, are in the lead in trying to save Magna Carta from final destruction by its inheritors and uh, the prospects for decent survival with it. Well, this is a pretty grim picture, but there are shafts of light and as always through history, there are two tendencies, two trajectories. And one is towards oppression, destruction. The other is towards justice and freedom. And the question is, which one is going to prevail? Uh, there is a, we can adapt the famous phrase of Martin Luther King's, there are ways to bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice and freedom by now, that means even survival, but not without dedicated and committed effort, the kind that's up to you. first time in its history, 
the South American countries are beginning to uh, integrate, which is a prerequisite for independence. Uh, they've thrown off uh, many of the demands of the uh, what's called the IMF World Bank Treasury Triumvirate, which runs the neoliberal order. Uh, they've begun to face some of their tremendous internal problems. And plenty of plenty of difficulties, plenty of problems, and plenty of protests, in fact. But it's quite significant that that's a dramatic development in 500 years. And by now, has reached the point where Canada and the United States are virtually being thrown out of the hemisphere, literally. Now, the last hemispheric meeting was in Colombia two years ago, and it could not reach a consensus, so it didn't have a formal declaration. The reason was that Canada and the United States refused to go along with the rest of the hemisphere on the crucial issues, the two crucial issues. One was admission of Cuba into the hemispheric system, which everyone else wanted, and Canada and the United States refused. Now, the other was steps towards decriminalization of drugs. Now, that's destroying South and Latin America. The problems in the North, both the demand is in the North and the supply is in the North, the supply of guns. So you look at the people who are being killed in Mexico, uh, the majority of the guns are coming from Texas and Arizona, where you can walk into a store and pick up an assault rifle and hand it over to the cartel guy who's waiting there. Uh, and the, the Latin American countries are moving towards decriminalization, some quite far. The Uruguay is moving towards total legalization. And they all want to do something, including the really harsh governments. U.S. and Canada refuse. If, it's quite likely that there, if, if there is a further hemispheric conference, U.S. and Canada simply may be excluded. Uh, if you think of what the uh, hemisphere was just a few years ago, that's a remarkable change. And there are plenty of others like it. In the Arab Spring, which is a complicated affair, uh, strong elements of it were dedicated to freeing up labor rights, uh, freeing up uh, uh, freedom of speech and association, and uh, attacking the very destructive neoliberal principles. And uh, there's a lot more, including in the West, in the Ignatius in Spain, Occupy movement, student movement right here. Now, there are things happening everywhere. So there's, but you're right, there is a kind of prevailing helplessness, hopelessness, we, a feeling we just can't do anything, it's too powerful for us. And it shows up in pretty striking ways. Actually, one of the most interesting uh, examples of it is uh, the, the pop, kind of popular movement quest, uh, uh, claiming that the Bush administration was involved, was responsible for 9-11. Uh, it turns out, if you look at polls, that maybe a third of the population in the U.S. think may, maybe you know, could, that willing to accept the possibility. But just think what that means. That means a third of the population, say, is willing to believe that we're run by homicidal maniacs who want to murder them. And there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. So, not a demonstration, not a protest, not a petition, nothing. Okay, that's the way it is. We can't lift our fingers. Well, that's a real pathology. And you know exactly how to deal with it. Exactly the way that was done right here uh, a year or two ago with the student strike and everything it led to. But that's the way to do it. And it can be very effective. against uh, 
of allowing women to vote was that it's unfair to unmarried men because it gives a married man two votes. Since obviously the property votes. <laughs> and that goes until quite recently. I don't know the Canadian laws, but in the United States, it was in 1975, not that far back, that women were declared by the Supreme Court to be persons, peers. They could serve on federal juries. It's supposed to be a jury of your peers. Well, you know, these, and by now it's changed a lot over 50 years. And that's uh, half the population, and it's uh, quite a significant change. It shows up all over the place. I don't know what this university was like 50 years ago, but mine, MIT, it wasn't technically legally male, but there were almost no women students, a tiny scattering of women faculty. And by now it's half women, third minorities, it was all white males. A lot of women on the faculty, many departments like mine, half women. These are enormous changes. How did they happen? Well, you know, it started with small consciousness raising groups, where people talking to each other, women talking to each other, built up into bigger organizations, finally uh, changed the, cu the culture and society. And there's many other examples. It's not hopeless. I mean, the doctrinal system wants you to think it's hopeless. You're supposed to be apathetic, uh, feeling that obedient, <coughs> feeling there's just nothing to be done, it's horrible, but nothing can be done there too powerful. That's not true. Power is very fragile. It can be overthrown easily. Thank you very much.
really enjoyed uh, this, your, your lecture. Um, I am a, an alumni of uh, Concordia, and I'm a law student currently at Purdue University. And uh, I'm from uh, Rwanda. I grew up in Kenya, and obviously, <coughs> the neoliberal policy has affected uh, developing uh, contexts. And uh, if you look at what's happening in Kenya, in the Congo, there's a, a connection in terms of uh, uh, what's going on in the West. And I was wondering, uh, people in the context that I come from are mostly interested in, uh, in immediate survival. And one of the other uh, challenges is uh, in education. So what are some of uh, the solutions that you propose in terms of a young person trying to uh, uh, create awareness in a population that's you know, not necessarily concerned with you know, a big <coughs> idea such as neoliberalism, but actually immediate survival, hunger, uh, lack of education. What are some of the propositions that you would uh, suggest? Yeah. You said you're from Rwanda. Yes, I'm from yeah. Rwanda. Well, as everyone knows, Rwanda suffered a horrendous catastrophe in the 1990s. Maybe close to a million people slaughtered in a couple of weeks. But there are aspects of that that are not discussed and should be, and I suspect you know about them. It didn't come from nowhere. Actually, I, I was writing about it in the 1970s. Actually, it was in Burundi at the time, but it was the same conflict. Uh, that was a time when you could have done something about it. In the 1980s, something was done about it by the West, namely intervention to make it a lot worse. <laughs> it was called the, it was the neoliberal programs. The World Bank and the IMF uh, imposed harsh structural adjustment programs in the 1980s. And these have the usual effect. They harm the economy, they harm the society, but they also exacerbate ethnic tensions. When you put a clamp on places, people, tensions that might be there tend to become worse. That's happened in Rwanda. It's part of the basis for what then finally broke out a couple of years later. The same things happened elsewhere. Same thing was happening in Yugoslavia in the in 1980s, same programs, same effects, part of the background for the atrocities that took place there later. Uh, these are things for us to think about. Uh, we're not without responsibility for what happens. That's even aside from the tradition, the colonial tradition, which was horrendous in Rwanda, Belgium, and so on. Uh, so this, this, these are things we should keep in mind. These atrocities and crimes, they don't come from nowhere. And our role is typically pretty significant. It's true right now, too. So take, say, Canadian mining operations, which are just a disaster all over the world. Now, they're a large part of the reason why you're getting tribal revolt wars, tribal revolts, uprisings, uh, with uh, people's, the possibility of survival being destroyed by uh, building a gold mine so some Canadian plutocrats can become twice as rich. You know, uh, It's not abstract. In fact, let's go to Congo. Congo is the worst disaster in the modern period. But nobody really knows because it's not, we don't investigate things that aren't nice. We investigate them if it's somebody else's crime, but not if it's ours. Uh, maybe four or five million people have been killed, something like that, in the past decade. Uh, they're being killed by, uh, mostly by militias. Actually, Rwanda's playing a significant role in this, as you know. Uh, the United States is backing Rwanda, which is uh, playing a big role in the Eastern Congo atrocities. But there's another element, like I'm sure all of you have cell phones. If you take your cell phone apart, you'll find uh, Coltan and other minerals in it. Well, they come from Eastern Congo. And somebody's making a ton of money out of that by exploiting the minerals that are stolen from Eastern Congo, which is very rich, namely multinational corporations. Now, they're not shooting the bullets, but they are behind the militias that are tearing the place to shreds and are in league with not no formal treaty, but they're in informal relations with the big multinational corporations that are giving us all our 
cell phones and the other things uh, we like to play with. Uh, that's a connection. It isn't investigated for a very simple reason. Uh, it would require looking into the mirror, and that's not what you do. You look at other people's crimes. You want to get ahead in the academic world, the journalistic world, be respected. Just take a look at somebody else's crimes. Don't look at ourselves. If you want to be a decent human being, you do the opposite. And here's a case where we could very well be doing the opposite. If somebody wants to destroy their academic career, a good thesis topic is the role of multinationals and the Congo <laughs> Trust. <laughs>
But we have to recognize that we are in this world. We can't pretend we're in another world. Canadian social democracy <laughs> around the turn 
the century. But that's all back. It's not that far back in our history. And I don't think it's far back in people's consciousness. I think it's just below the surface. And as soon as the opportunity arises, that's the development that people quite happily and willingly move into. Actually, it's happening now. It, it, it ha it's gone on for a long time in Canada, the big cooperative movement and the Atlantic provinces and so on. But it's going on in the United States. These uh, substantial growth of you know, worker-owned enterprises in parts of the old Rust Belt, Cleveland and Northern Ohio, it's expanding. Not huge, but it's expanding. It's an alternative model. It's a radical alternative model, the one that's deeply rooted in history and easily understood in popular consciousness, and it could lead to massive changes. Uh, if there was a, suppose there'd been a strong Occupy movement, stronger, it was important what it was. I suppose it was much larger and earlier. Uh, go back a couple of years. In uh, 2008, uh, the, the US government essentially nationalized the auto industry. Not all of it, but most of it. It bailed it out, took control over it. Essentially nationalized it. Uh, there were a couple of options. The one option was to restore it to its former owners or other people just like you know, maybe a different face with the same arrangements, and have the auto industry go back to producing cars. Okay, that's the one that was chosen. If there had been a substantial popular movement, say like Occupy, but bigger, could have pressed for something else, to turn the industry over to the workforce and let them do something that's needed, like for example, decent mass transportation. It's a total wreck in the United States. I mentioned some examples all over, not producing more cars for traffic jams, but uh, producing mass transportation to deal with the environmental uh, problem, but also with people's comfort. You know, it's a lot easier to sit in a subway for 10 minutes than to sit in a traffic jam for an hour. Uh, and, uh, and I think people respond to that. It would have been quite possible under, if, if the population had been more organized and active, to press for uh, taking the industry over and turning it to something constructive instead of destructive. And there are things like that all the time. They're right on the board, but you have to do something about them. And, but notice that those are not small changes. These would be very radical changes. They yield a completely different socioeconomic system. But they're not too far from reach. It's not a matter of, uh, you know, there's going to be a revolution. To it's possible to create the seeds of revolutionary change right in the present society. And I think there are plenty of ways of doing that. has never developed class politics. 
there's never been a Labour Party. And not that the Labour Parties are all that amazing, but <laughs> there are countries that have parliamentary Labour Parties, that have socialists in Parliament and so on. Not the United States. And one of the main reasons is it has never escaped slavery in the Civil War. The parties are sectional parties, not class parties, which means they're very easily taken over by major corporate business interests when there's no class basis. Uh, the slogan back in the late 19th century was, uh, you vote the way you shoot. And that remains true. You go to places like, uh, say, the Mississippi, poorest state in the country. It's the recipient of more federal aid than every any other state. But the, the majority of the population there, probably certainly a large number, would be perfectly willing to see the state go totally down the tube if they could destroy Washington and win the Civil War. So that's a lot of what's going on in the United States. And the effect of slavery was never really overcome. I don't know how much of you know the history. It's worth looking at the history. Uh, technically, the Civil War led to amendments that freed the slaves. And it lasted about 10 years, formally. Uh, after that, a compact was reached between the North and the South which enabled the slave-owning states to do whatever they felt like. And what they did essentially was criminalize black life. So they instituted legal procedures which essentially made every black male certainly a criminal. Like if a black man standing on the street corner could be arrested for a vagrancy, a $10 fine, which you can't a lot of money then, which you can't pay and there's a corrupt judge pretty soon he's in jail forever. And if he looks the wrong way, or somebody says he's looking the wrong way at a white woman, uh, attempted rape, you're in jail forever. Yeah. Pretty soon they had most of the black male population in jail, uh, literally. That's a, that was a workforce. It was a slave labor force. It's a large part of the American Industrial Revolution, if you look at it. The mining, the U.S. steel industry, a lot of it developed in the former slave states. Uh, with a wonderful workforce. For the owners, it was better. We were familiar with the chain gangs. Everybody remembers them, you know. That's the agricultural part, but it was also in the industrial part. Uh, it, for owners, it's fantastic. If you own slaves, they're capital. You have to maintain them. You have to make sure they survive till the next year. You know. If the government owns the slaves, they're in jail. That's perfect. You don't have to pay for them. You don't have to do anything for them. Uh, state will somehow provide for them. You just make the profit. But that went on until the Second World War. The Second World War, they needed free labor you know, for the wartime industry. Okay, then it changed. Then you get the big southern immigrations up to the northern cities, the slums. But what's happened since? Well, for about 20 years, there was a period of substantial and egalitarian growth. Pretty egalitarian. You had, some, you had the New Deal measures, and very high growth rates. Uh, a black man could uh, work in the auto industries, let's say it was unionized to get pretty decent wages, uh, uh, maybe buy a small house, you know, send his kid to college, and sort of begin to work into the society the way other immigrant groups have done. Much harsher because the racism is endemic, but still possible. And then comes the neoliberal period. It ends. Uh, the, uh, the workforce, largely black, later Hispanic, is a superfluous population. You can get cheaper workers in northern Mexico or southern, southeastern China or something like that. So they're superfluous. What happened is they were sent back to jail. That's what's happened in the last 30 years. Okay, take a look at incarceration rates in the United States. <coughs> Around 1980, approximately the same as other industrial countries, slightly higher, but not much. But since 1980, it's just shot sky high, way beyond any other country. By far the highest of any country that has any statistics. Uh, and it's just, and it's mostly black males. There's a technique for criminalizing them now. It's called drugs. 
the drug war was designed, almost crucially designed, as a race war. It was designed in such a way that it targets mainly black males, by now Hispanics, and by now it's extended to women, but it's mainly black, later Hispanic males, tosses them in jail. Uh, the whole system is rigged that way. From where police look, you know, you look in some places, you don't look at other places, uh, to how the courts work, to the nature of the sentencing, okay, all the way through, it's a huge racket, which essentially is redoing what was done in the late 19th century. Well, that's, and as I said, it's hitting the political system. You still have sectional parties, never had class-based parties. A lot of what's going in, on in Washington is, let's destroy the federal government uh, because they want, because we want to win the Civil War. Uh, so when you talk about equal, inequality, I mean, you know, this is, this is a phenomenal uh, 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 situation. And there's other, you know, it shows up in other countries too. The United States is not the only, only one, though it is kind of extreme because of the effect of slavery. You find it elsewhere. So there's, yes, there's plenty of inequality in the last, there's another kind of inequality that's talked about that's income inequality, and that's shot up during the neoliberal period. The neoliberal programs are designed to, uh, to, to uh, concentrate wealth in extremely small sectors of the population, and mostly in sectors that are predatory. They do not contribute to the economy back to those quotes I read about the financial institutions. They're predatory, destructive institutions, sustained by the taxpayers. That's uh, what the IMF report pointed out. They harm the economy, and they concentrate wealth enormously. And that just totally pollutes the political process. It means that elections always were more or less bought. Now it's extreme, you know, it's getting worse. Well, that's another kind of inequality, and it's, these are not laws of nature. You know, they can be changed. They've been different in the past, they're different elsewhere. But it's the usual story. You have to do something about it. It's not going to improve by itself.